how great your technology is or how smart your individual developers are, if you don't eliminate the blockers, you'll never go anywhere. And we see four fundamental things that need to be embedded into your mind when you think about innovation. Starts with culture, focuses on skills, how you organize, and how you fund. So let's go through these one by one because it's really important. And I, I love this. Everything that we learn as children, we can apply to life. Unfortunately, it usually takes a long time for us to realize how much we learned when we were children. One of my favorite books is The Little Prince. And there's a, there's a quote in there that says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. What does that mean? That means inspire your employees, inspire your communities. Give them an idea of where to go, and then let them go do it. Get out of their way. Steve Jobs once said, hire the smartest people you can and then get out of their way so that they can go create. And that is one of the biggest mistakes businesses, governments, institutions forget about when they're bringing together teams for innovation. They like to be prescriptive, build in key constraints and tell them where to go and expect them to just work towards it. That's the old way of doing things. If you really want to unblock innovation, you let the creativity come from elsewhere. I once worked at Sun Microsystems where we said innovation comes from elsewhere. What did that mean? What was the principle? That meant that the boss wasn't always right or didn't have all of the answers. And then it was up to everybody in the organization from the CEO all the way down to the administrator to come up with new ideas for building things moving forward. And we see that in so many companies today from a cultural perspective. Nordstrom is an interesting brand. When you think about brick and mortar retail, many of the retail companies in this world are going away because it's all shifted to online. And so some of the classic businesses that we've seen no longer exist. Yet one of the oldest in the States is Nordstrom, who continues to thrive and grow and continues to build just a phenomenal culture. And what's interesting is they only have one rule. Use good judgment in all situations. Back to that statement around enabling innovation, what they're saying with this one rule is regardless of whether you're sweeping floors or running an entire store, make good judgments that help bring joy and satisfaction to your customers and we will progress. And it's when they make those judgments that new services come. And as new services come, new experiences happen, customers become more satisfied, business grows. We'll go to something a little more recent, Netflix, television company. They have a set of principles in there, but it's the number three that I love. Freedom and responsibility. Trust, but verify. Enable everyone in the organization to contribute to innovation and come up with ideas, but verify that those ideas are aligned with the business direction of where you're going and aligned with the core principles of the company. This is another really great lessons learned from a cultural perspective that doesn't exist in many entities today because it's not the way we normally think. At Amazon, we have 14 leadership principles. And to put that in perspective, we were talking about it last night. It sounds like Amazon, from an employee perspective, is three times the size of Sarajevo. That's how many employees we have in that organization. How do you build a company that can innovate that quickly when it's of that size? We do it by basically having 12 principles. And these principles go into our hiring practices. They go into all of our business decisions. In fact, every meeting, one or two of these principles will be mentioned with regards to how we make decisions. At the top of it is customer obsession. We are crazy about customer obsession. And what does that mean? That means we're not waiting to see what our competitors are doing. We're not worried about where others are taking the market. We're engaging directly with the customer to understand what is it they are looking for from a point of value, and that's what we focus on building. 
That is the spark that drives those new features and the innovation that you see from AWS every day. So when you think about culture, whether you're building for the future of smart cities or you're just building your own idea, be intentional about the culture. Don't just have a set of priorities that sit on your badge. Have a set of priorities that build the spirit of all of the parties involved in moving things forward, whether they are employees, partners, users, etc. Make sure that it's appropriate. In the Netflix space, tight and focused. This is where we're going. Everybody lines up and executes on that. If you have broad initiatives like smart cities, set the core principles and let everybody else act around those principles. Line up and deliver on where you're going. And ultimately ensure that at the core of your culture, you're enabling everybody in your organization to make good judgment. Because surprisingly enough, we all have positive intent. We're all trying to go th make things better for ourselves and the people around us. Enable us to make those decisions and push things forward. Okay, skills. And I saw we had a number of university students in here. This is super important inside of fast evolving markets, right? Train, learn on everything that is in front of you. I sit and think about just programming languages or development structures. Just within the last couple of years, we moved from servers to virtualization, from virtualization to containers, containers to, to, to microservices, and now we're headed down a path of serverless. In the old days, you would dedicate yourself to one thing and do that extremely well, but things are moving so fast you can't do that. So constantly refresh your skills and capabilities. Learn about everything that is happening and understand how you can build that into the opportunity and the direction that you're taking your business. Encourage your employees to learn about how technology has shifted so that they can bring those into your business, right? Fun Pathfinder teams. When I say learn about the new things, that doesn't mean move everybody onto the new technology after every new release. What I mean by that is identify how you leverage new technology to fund new ideas so that you're trying to evolve without disrupting what you already have in place. Now the hardest part about this, because we all go through training, we all continually are learning, is you also have to be prepared to incent your staff, to incent your communities, to build the ecosystem around it such that it thrives. Because if you don't do that, I'm going to take my learnings and I'm going to move to the next person. And incentivization is not always about money. It's about building the support structure such that you know you can drive success and happiness with the users within your ecosystem. How many in the room are responsible for building, hiring, or managing a team? Do we have a few? Okay. This book, I am from Amazon, so I will try and sell books. This book was written by the Chief Human Resources Officer from Netflix. And when you hand it to most HR groups around the globe, it blows their mind. Because it fundamentally takes the concept of human resources and flips it on its head. And it talks about nurturing and growing culture and training your staff for success and driving retainment of that staff back to the business. To put that in perspective, from an Amazon perspective, we have 3% retention across our vast user base, our employee base. That's what you want. Train, embrace, enable, and retain your staff. Organization, another really key thing. At Amazon, we have a principle that talks about two pizza teams. What does that mean? That basically means that the teams that are involved in building new products should be able to be fed via two pizzas at mealtime. Anything larger than that, you've now introduced way too much complexity into the system and innovation will stall. And these product teams, they own everything from ideation through delivery. The biggest challenge we have today is somebody goes and builds a product, and when you're done with that product, you hand it to somebody else to go operate. 
and you hand it to somebody else to go support, and you hand it to somebody else to go sell. At Amazon, from ideation to delivery, sales, operations, customer engagement, and development is the same team. It's not seen as a project. It is seen as a long-term product um, uh, piece. Focus on continuous delivery. When you're done with the product, you're not done with the product. How do we get to daily innovation? We continue to evolve. We continue to improve. And it's through that improvement that these new features become exposed and customers become better satisfied. Run what you wrote is super important. The biggest conflict businesses have today is talking amongst teams to figure out why did you do it that way and why does it not work within my system. At Amazon, if you build it, you run it. And what that does is it removes technical debt. Technical debt comes from the fact that when you build infrastructure that's separate from the applications and teams that are responsible for each of those core pieces, the confusion and the technical debt increases, innovation decreases, and the project most likely will fail. If we have project managers in the room, I apologize for this next statement, but another book for you to read is one product, Project to Product, and it talks about that evolution of getting to a product mindset. And for those of you that are project managers, Amazon has eliminated project managers within our product teams because they realized product teams have more strength focused on that long-term engagement than trying to get through individual projects. Last one is risk. Now this is an interesting one because when cloud first started, what we heard so much was, I'm going to trade CapEx for OpEx. It's an it, it, it's a accounting principle. And that's actually not going to get you there. Cloud brings new economics with regards to building infrastructure and new economics with regards to the delivery of your service. But 80% of the cost in the system is also how you fund the developers and keep them engaged on driving the most efficient environments, continually improving their code, and engaging with customers. So you have to factor that into how you're building out your model. You can't be thinking about, I'm going to go set aside $2 million to build this product. You have to think about, what is it going to take to continue to evolve? And as you see the business moving, increase or decrease the expenditures as you head down that path. Remove cost as a blocker. Okay, so now we talked, or now we finished, what are the blockers, now let's talk about enablers. And I actually simplify this down into three key areas. Speed of movement, scale of movement, and strategic nature of movement. This is how you build for an innovative culture. But first, let's define what's the fundamental metric of innovation? How do you measure it? For me, I actually believe it's time to value. You do some work, who knows how long it takes, and it delivers value to the customer. The longer that point is in the middle, the slower your innovation is. When you think about the old waterfall way of developing new services or the project planning way of doing things, this was measured in months. We moved down a, a, a program or, or an operating model called Scrum, which was faster moving teams, taking from the sports analogy. That's measured in days. Today, the most innovative companies are changing by the minute. This is the concept of continuous innovation. It marries continuous development and continuous integration to get your culture and your people focused on continually innovating and providing new services to your customer. Why is it and how do you do it? Well, first thing you gotta do is think of everything from a small changes perspective. Smart cities is a massive undertaking. And if you're trying to get to that end state all at once, you will never get there. You will continue to spiral down the path of getting there. So the first thing to do is break it down into projects. My favorite story on this, the, the uh, moon landing from the States back in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s, right? So when we go all the way back to the moon landing, when they decided the spot where the moon lander was going to hit the moon, they decided that within 100 feet, 
six years prior to going to the moon. They decided that before they even realized how to get out of our atmosphere. Think about that. They had a common objective of where they wanted to go, and then they built all the steps for getting there, and they celebrated the successes by executing towards those small steps and then realizing that huge accomplishment of putting a man on the moon. From a software perspective, there is no economy of scale in pushing everything together. The more you build it, the bigger it becomes, the more complex it is, and the less chance you have of being successful. In the cloud, lots of small things means you have to change some of the fundamental things that you're doing from a business perspective. Automate everything. If it can be automated, automate it. Because when you're thinking in terms of millions, you can't have human hands on the keyboard or human hands in the switches looking at how things are working. Leverage tools that help you automate, test, and bring feedback back into your, in, into your systems loop. A-B testing and the likes. That helps you understand how you're progressing. And then focus on doing really cheap builds. Don't spend time building for perfection. Get to minimal viable project first and iterate and iterate quickly. This is how you drive to a model of small changes. In development languages, that means going from monoliths to microservices. When I worked at Sun, we did everything in Java, and it was funny because we would get engineers that would leave for the day or leave for an evening because they put their code into a build command, and it would take seven hours to return results. Today, go build. You don't even have time to go for a cup of coffee. It'll instantly give you feedback. That's the benefit of looking at some of these new modern architectures. You also have to separate code from features. Biggest mistake innovators have is you're constantly building one infrastructure and assuming that that'll work for all the new features that you want to build. And you combine them together and you update that infrastructure when you update to a new feature. You need to separate that. Continually be innovating at the infrastructure level. Continue to change that. Start to insert new features into that process and expose them when they're ready. That's how you get from 80 to 1,900 services in a year. So why small changes? It's less risk. The bigger the project, the bigger the risk. Break them down into small things, eliminate risk, find your problems faster because you have isolated projects that you're working through. It means faster repair, happier developers, happier customers because your scene is continually progress, progressing versus fixing. Now, how do you do that? Step one, measure your time to value. If you are in the middle of building something, how long will it take from you building something to customer delight? And understand all of the elements that happen in between service creation and service delivery and how you can shorten that timeline as much as possible. How much overhead or how much process is getting in the way of you basically moving forward? That's the first step. Figure that out. And now you're headed down the path of getting there. Learn to do things in small steps. Now, an interesting one here, we worked with a bank on transformation, and if you think about banks, they've been around for centuries, and the technologies that banks have are highly regulated, super complex, and very challenging, right? There's so much compliance that goes into it. And so when we engaged with the bank, they talked about the fact that we can't change this because it's so big and so long, it'll take us five years to get there. But we did convince them to start doing small things, Change the website, build an app for your phone, build a new experience in the stores or in the banks, etc. What was interesting was helping them start to go down the small steps was the first phase. They built a fast pass that removed all the blockers and all the process headaches so that they could do simple things like update an app on the phone. Interestingly, the team that was responsible for the behemoth, the big 
piece of code, they broke that down into chunks so it would fit the fast path process. And the teams that were part of that, they thought they were cheating the system because they found a way to get through. In the end, they changed their culture and they changed the model by breaking things up into small things which eliminated the risk, avoided all of the challenges around compliance and helped the bank move forward. So that's a real big thing to learn as you go down this initiative of smart cities. Smart cities is a big vision, but start with the small things and make incremental improvements on that. And then finally, measure the cost. Always be looking to take things out, right? What does it take to test? How many tickets did it take you to deploy something? How many meetings did you have because meetings are needed? Identify those things and throw them out. Get rid of them. Build efficiency into the system, automate everything, and constantly be getting feedback on the performance of that system. This is how we think about things at Amazon. This is what helps us move at the speed that we move at. More books. Like I said, I'm from Amazon. We're a bookseller. Um, Barry O'Reilly, he is actually one of the leaders in helping organizations transform. And Lean Enterprise is a great one that talks about hypothesis-driven product development. How to design for that big end state, but break everything down and start moving things forward. So this is a great book to go down that path. Another one, same author, is Unlearn. Our biggest challenge is the fact that we're stuck in our old ways of doing things. So how do you move forward? You learn the process of breaking your old habits and embracing some of these new ones to push forward. And then finally, this one's a little more, more scientific. Um, so for the university students, this is perfect for you. When you go into a company like Amazon or Google or Salesforce or YouTube, they follow a process of flow. And flow has become the new model by which they develop and drive towards continuous innovation. So this is a really important book to pick up and understand those processes. But to summarize back, time to value, learn to do simple things quickly, to unblock innovation, and avoid complex one-size-fits-all. Because most likely, that'll never get you there, right? And, you know, this will probably upset all of my Cisco friends. Um, the best architecture today is minimalist, messy, and inconsistent. Because driving to get to consistency and perfection only slows you down. Right? The one thing you do do with your users is focus on the three things that help them push forward. Security, scalability, and available. Can I get my service? Can I get my service where I am? And is my data secure? Those are the three fundamental user needs, government needs, industry needs. Solve for that. Don't try and reinvent infrastructure. Realize that it will be inconsistent and messy. And if you do that, you're now designed to evolve rapidly and you're able to build something that focuses on getting the services to your customers as soon as possible. So now we're, we've covered speed, let's get into scale because this becomes really complex for many. We believe that in order to achieve scale in the millions to billions, you have to take some fundamentals of cloud native principles. Pay as you go, we talked about expenses. It should be pay as you go afterwards. Don't budget a project and then try and fill up your activities so that you hit that budget. Identify the activity start to execute, and leverage a practice where you pay as you go, right? That's a crazy idea that most people don't realize, but when you unblock that, when you pull that budgetary piece out, you actually start to increase the velocity and the speed at which things happen. Focus on self-service. Automation and self-service is the only way you're going to get to billions of support. Make it globally distributed. Partner, or even regionally distributed. Partner with your telcos, right? B&H Telecom here, Azure, Google. This is who you partner with because they're the ones who are going to enable you to scale. And then remember that your code should be built on an immutable principle. Don't rebuild the system every time. 
Launch a new system. Identify when that system can take over and then retire the old. The biggest mistake people keep trying to do is improve the system that's running today. And if you do that, you're introducing too many errors and increasing the risk of the system. So I'm going to walk through a model of building a product that kind of puts it in a different perspective of how you get to scale. And you start, of course, with the user need. And in this case, what's the problem we're trying to solve? I'm a nerd. I want to build a model spaceship, right? So let's go down the path of building a model sh spaceship the old way, right? You design a prototype, carve some molding clay, make some molds, produce an injection to the molded parts, send it off to the factory. Months later, I've got my Millennium Falcon, or I've got my parts to build my Millennium Falcon. And I sit in my, my study and I put it together, and when I'm done, there's nothing else I can do with it. It sits on the shelf, gathers dust, I throw it away in a short period of time. Good satisfaction, not long-term viable. Right? So let's take a look at another way of thinking about building a Millennium Falcon. I'm Danish, so I like to use Legos as an example. A bag of blocks, some instructions, a few hours, and I have my Millennium Falcon again. Now, is it true to detail like that model sitting on my shelf? Not at all, right? It's got some flaws. It's not necessarily, you know, got the fine detail that I can appreciate, but you know what? It kind of looks like that Millennium Falcon. But if I need to iterate on that, I can start to modify by finding other standard blocks from Lego and say, now it's not the Millennium Falcon. It's, you know, I, I don't even know what, what name I'd call it, but it's still a spaceship, the U-Lander Falcon. There you go. <laughs> um, if I'm Lego, I can optimize. I can see where my users are making modifications, and I can now make an improvement with one single brick. That's innovation, believe it or not. And that individual brick works really well for my Millennium Falcon, but even better, when I'm done with it and I'm sick of it sitting on my shelf, I can take all those blocks apart and use them again to build something new, right? So that's the way you need to be thinking about things. Not long-term perfection, but short-term minimal viable. And if you think about these principles and the companies that are out there, traditional, Siebel, rapid development, Salesforce. It was good enough. Traditional BMW and Mercedes-Benz. New Tesla. I'll tell you, the first Tesla Roadster was a little junker that they came out with. The first S, it was okay. But now they have a common platform with basic building blocks where they continue to innovate based on what's available to them. And they're now seen as one of the fastest movers in the automotive industry. And it's not because the car is battery powered. It's because it has so many cool new things and features that they can build on. That's the way to be thinking about it. Small iterations based on standard building blocks gets you there. They say that the more constrained an environment, the more innovation you get. Now that seems a little bit at odds with it, but the reality is when you have infinite resource to build whatever you want, you're always building and never getting to the final state. When you have constraints and limited time, you find a way to get there as fast as possible and you build your business. This is how we think about things at Amazon. Okay, last one. Speed, scale. Now how do you ensure that you're strategic? How do you make sure that you can run this as a business? So we'll start with a fairy tale. Once upon a time, if in theory, if everything works perfectly, we have a plan to survive the disasters we thought of in advance. I don't think so. Failures happen. And we always have to plan for failures and build that into the system. But the interesting thing when we're building infrastructure is how do we define failure? How many have a data center in the room? Or manage a data center or a part of a data center? Okay. We got a couple of you. Do you, do you back up that data center? Do you have a backup for that data center? Do you fail over your applications? Do you fail over your data center? When we talk to customers about this, they do it because of compliance. They do it once a year. And ironically, every time they do it, it breaks everything in the system because all the changes they made through that year aren't actually reflected in the failover system. 
So they've planned for failure, but failure will still happen because they haven't built the right infrastructure to get there. We call it availability theater. Yes, I'm available. Oh shoot, I'm down, right? So the reason why businesses are moving to a cloud architecture is because it removes some of that variability and it removes a lot of that concern and risk over reliability and resiliency in the system. And therefore, we're seeing a fundamental shift. Banking, smart cities, e-health, e-government, all moving to the cloud because they're realizing that this is what helps them maintain and manage for consistent uptime and reliability. Moving from a model where we're planning for failure via disaster recovery into one of chaos engineering. I don't know if you guys have heard that term. In 2009, a young man named Jesse Robbins at Amazon, he, he uh, changed his title to Master of Disaster. He worked in IT, and he went around pulling plugs on data centers and on servers. He went around introducing new code that basically broke everything. And he did it on purpose. Because when you have those challenges hit every day for your systems, your developers need to figure out how to fix that. Now put that in real world practice when you have hackers. Every day, no matter where you are, there are hackers trying to hit your system and get your information. They will always find new ways of doing so. You have to build a culture and a practice that ensures that that doesn't happen. You do that by building the hackers into your system itself. That's called chaos engineering. It's not a subset of responsibilities for your developers. It's a new team designed to take everything down. There's a number of companies out there that basically help businesses embrace chaos engineering. And when you do that, and you build in a highly automated fashion, and you bring an analytics and evaluation into your systems, you actually start to get to true autonomy, self-healing systems, self-healing applications, constantly available, highly secure, and that's the foundation for how you shift strategic workloads into production and evolve what you're trying to do for your economy. That starts in the cloud. You can't do this in your own system. You're spending too much time updating your infrastructure versus focusing on moving forward. This is not a plug for Amazon because when I say the cloud, this is your B&H Telecom, this is your Azure, this is your Oracle and IBM, this is your Amazon. That's where you need to start thinking about taking your infrastructure. And when you do that, that once a year panic of did I meet my disaster recovery certification so that I can re retain my compliance, that goes away because it's automated and you're running these practices every day. And ultimately, that testing mitigation, right, that resiliency planning gets built into the system so you're always ready for disaster or always ready for a failure. The last books I'll share with you, Drift into Failure. This is a great one unless you're on a plane. Chapter two talks about planes that have 90,000 hours of successful flights that all of a sudden go down and kill hundreds of people. It talks about where the failures happen and where, in the design, where the design flaw was in preparing for failure that the businesses missed. So this is a great fundamental book on learning on how to address and predict or prepare for failure. Another one, release it. This is about removing risk iterating quickly, and again, planning for failure in doing so. So there's some great examples in that. Back to the beginning, we're in a fundamentally new world. As you build out your new cities, your smart cities, you have to fundamentally change the old IT model and bring it forward to today. And that becomes the foundation for the innovation that we've been talking about. And just to put that in a real life Commercial example, the one plug I'll give for Amazon, it's my last slide. Volkswagen Industrial Cloud. Three years ago, they made the decision that they wanted to tie together everything in their supply chain. I'm gonna get you the exact stats just to be specific. 1,500 suppliers, 30,000 locations, millions and hundreds of millions of sensors, all, commu all communicating together all working off the same plan, 
all working together to move things forward. This is the Volkswagen industrial cloud. This is how they've moved to solve that problem. And at the anchor point, the cornerstone of that change, Amazon has been participating in it. So that's where we learn about how customers can do this stuff at scale or how you can drive initiatives like smart cities at scale. And in the case of Volkswagen, it started small and they had to evolve in order to adapt to that large of a, of a reach that they needed to, to get to. So with that, I'm going to wish you best on your transformation um, and wish you well in building the next generation of smart cities. Sarajevo is beautiful. I've really enjoyed my, my time here in um, uh, Bosnia. Uh, I will, I, yes, heads to go, yep. Um, I'm horrible, horrible at names. But I've re this has just been such a phenomenal experience. I appreciate your time and, and sitting through this for the last half hour. So thank you very much. Maybe for two questions. Thank you, Peter, for this very inspirational speech. I, for one, do not regret not having a coffee break just before. Um, I know I have a few questions, and I'm sure that uh, the audience has a number of questions. So we have a microphone. Um, are there any questions that you wish to ask? You have a wonderful and unique opportunity. Any students? Any colleagues? Well, until we have somebody who's comfortable with asking a question, um, I'll refer back to one of your first slides, and that was the one about the little prince. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that uh, story in a different context, paraphrased, about uh, inspiring rather than guiding. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's a bit of a cultural clash there in terms of both the environment that you work in and the uh, setting of the actual company. Mm -hmm. So you still have a structure in your company. You Absolutely. still have a CEO and you still have a, a huge, and you have a huge company. How do you still tell and how do you guide that company with this principle of do not guide, but rather inspire? Yeah, sure. Um, so the best way to think about that, I'll go back to the moon landing example, right? The inspiration was we will be the first nation on the planet to put a human being on the moon. That's your North Star. That's your guidance. As a leader, did I know how to go do that? Right? Did JF Kennedy know how to put a man on the moon? Absolutely not. Did NASA know how to put a man on the moon? No, he didn't either. Right? Or they didn't either. They came back and they basically built teams to go solve all the little problems with that one goal of hitting that North Star of the landing spot on the moon. That is huge in today's realm, but now break that down into a regular company. Netflix, we're going to change the way that TV is consumed or content is created. Those are the guardrails by which they develop on, right? That's the vast blue sea. We're going to let the engineers figure out how to go hit that. And then that trust and verify. Make sure that the projects that you're engaging in are aligned to hitting that goal, not we're going to change the movie theaters of the world and build new, bigger systems. No, we are going to deliver digital content to users on their mobile devices or in the home via streaming content. That's it, All right? Brings me to the next question. And that's the, uh, <laughs> also one loaded. of your slides that you said that you're um, obsessed with customers mm -hmm. uh, and um, in what the customers want. Now, how do you, t how do you know what do they want always? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it actually true that it's, what, what is it that the customers want? And uh, when is it that you actually give them something that they will want, that you make them want something? Yeah. Good I, uh, from my own experience, I, I didn't know I wanted something. But once it was available, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I want that. Mm -hmm. what, what's the fine line between what do the customers want and what do you think they need? A couple of examples then, right? There's a famous Henry Ford quote, and I know that I'll get it wrong, but it basically said, that if I'd waited for my customers to tell me they wanted cars, right, I'd still be building faster horses today, right? There is generally a shift where customers will tell you what they want. You have to be creative about the solution for getting that, right? There's a very controversial thing, not one that I necessarily endorse, but I will use it as an example because it's an interesting one. Um, Monsanto, they figured out how to make grass that only grows so high. What does that mean? I don't have to mow my lawn that much. The inspiration came from the fact that people didn't want to mow their lawn. 
And so they went and figured out, how do I reduce that time? So, so it's about understanding requirements, not waiting for the customer to tell you exactly what to build, which is a great reason why I showed the Lego example. Mm -hmm. I want a spaceship. I'm going to give you 60% of that spaceship, and you're going to show me how you would modify it, and then I'll iterate to make it better. And pretty soon, I'll have that Lego Millennium Falcon project for you to buy. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, you're also welcome to ask a question in uh, Bosnian Croatian Serbian. Imamo prevod, možete slobodno postaviti pitanje na našem jeziku isto tako, tako da ne možete se usrećavati. Evo imam jedno pitanje ovdje. Hvala. Uh, Amazon is a global brand and I'm interested in a uh, uh, question. Is it, uh, do you have the same approach for Amazon for US? for EU and for other countries, uh, are there some difference? Because I know Amazon in, in Germany is not so fast as in the US, where it's on really daily basis in, in the EU, you have yep. to wait a little bit more. What are the, the global uh, mm -hmm. differences between uh, using Amazon in US and uh, in Europe, for example? So, uh, so back to the common principles. One of the big things that we do as we, in, as we, we build and continue to grow Amazon is we think globally, and that think globally means we're going to have data centers and availability in every corner of the globe, but act locally. Because the reality is you're all sovereign nations. You all have independent regulations and needs and requirements. You all have different types of infrastructure. And what we do at that point is we partner with governments and regions to ensure that we solve for those critical needs without deprecating the services that we're delivering to the customers. That's why you might see a little bit of a difference between performance in one and performance in another or services in one versus the other. But it's how we continue to build and grow and make sure that we hit that goal of having the you know, enormous global footprint. And one last question is how do you measure time to value? At Amazon it's measured in minutes. Minutes. Thank you very much for this uh, very inspirational speech. Appreciate Thank it. Thank time. you very much.